G'day campers and welcome back to another Thursday Night Live. Tonight I am privileged, I'm honoured and I'm grateful for the two human beings sitting here tonight. Tonight we're talking about suicide. Suicide's a big topic in our, in our communities at the moment and one that is, is rising unfortunately and it's not something that's being tackled enough. Are we tackling it right? I don't know. Can we be looking at doing things in a different way? Yes, we can. But we're talking about it. It's a start. We're here. We're opening up the conversation. We're learning. We're sitting here wanting to learn and understand what people have experienced so that we can learn that it's not just us that feel something. We're feeling this together. So tonight we're going to open up with the love in our heart for two people who have had suicidal thoughts throughout their life and we're going to dive into it. So I really want to thank you, Maria McGrath and Sharon Chamello for coming into this space to have this conversation because I feel now more than ever it is so important. The photo that I put up for tonight's live, the semicolon, is quite a well-known tattoo and it's a tattoo that signifies somebody's been suicidal or attempted suicide and they're still here and they're proud to be here. If you ever see that tattoo on somebody, and this might get me a little bit, please thank them. Mm. Please thank them for still being here and still doing their best mm. because they're worth it. Absolutely. Mm. So tonight, with the questioning, I'm going to ask people to hold back a little bit. Listen tonight. Tonight's about listening. At the end of the night, if you've got questions or you feel triggered or something you want to talk about, please reach out. Yeah. Maria, Sharon, myself, we're all here for you to reach out. So I appreciate that. So without further ado, we're going to dive straight into it. Quick hello to make sure just to see how things are. We haven't seen Maria for a little while. How are you, Maria? I'm really, really good, Scott. Thank you. I'm really, I'm really glad to be here because it's it's a really important thing for me to be telling my story and helping others. I know mm. when I was in the depths of despair and, and having those thoughts, it was that I didn't think anybody else felt like I felt. So mm. just having that knowing that you're not alone, that other people are struggling in this way and we can get through it together. And just knowing that makes a big difference, I think. So I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, and I'm grateful yeah. for you just getting here with us, opening this conversation. Thank you so much, Maria. So, Arnie Shays, how are you? Sharon Chamello? I'm very well, thank you. Um, and like Maria, yeah, I'm pleased to be able to talk about this because, you know, the old story, if it helps one person, we've done our job. And hopefully we'll help more than that by normalising it, by sharing our stories. Yeah, and thank you. I really do appreciate that. Okay. If it's okay, I'd like to start with Maria. We'll open up with Maria and then come back to you on the shows and we'll open sure. up a little bit. It goes where it goes and we'll go from there. So, so Maria, thank you again for opening this up. But I want to go back in time to when you first had suicidal thoughts. How old were you and what were the circumstances? You know, I was 18, 19, um, somewhere around then. I know I was going to the pub, um, so I was over 18. I know I felt you know, I was really lonely and isolated, even though I wasn't. I had a great family, great friends, you know, work life, all of the rest of it. But within myself, I felt alone. Mm. And I just had had this, and I don't know why, or I do now, but I didn't then, um, just this <laughs> feeling of that I was all alone. And there was a steep sadness within me, I think, from about the age of 15. But I know mm. when I started going out that um, I would be the life of the party i'd have an absolute wonderful time when i was out in amongst the crowd but then when, as soon as i was alone 
there would be tears streaming down my face. I'd be crying and howling and, and not even aware of what started it or what triggered it or why it happened. And, and I can remember having this, just this thought coming in my head, you know, I just want to drive my car into a tree. And I don't know where it come from. And I don't know why it was in that moment. It was, it was shock that that was within me. But I can remember it so clearly that, that, that they were there. And it was, um, I guess for me, it was a matter of, from that point, managing how I went out and what I did and, and it was the going home alone that always triggered me. So I would stay with friends instead of going home and, and doing things like that so mm -hmm. that um, I didn't leave the party alone, I guess, to, to sort of say. And I, I had no understanding. It was really shocking and awful. And 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 it, it, it creates, when you don't know why you're thinking something, then you beat yourself up even more thinking, what's wrong with me? Why am I doing this? Why am I feeling like this? What's wrong with me? I must be broken. And so there's more internal noise that goes on, which then, you know, it's just this endless mouse wheel that you can't sort of seem to get off. Um, but it, it, it went, it, it was really bad for a little while and then it went away. And I, I sort of had moments, but not of those suicidal thoughts, probably more until I hit my, my 30s and into my late 30s, it was really bad. It was a, an every day and I couldn't couldn't not think it at mm. that point. Yeah. yeah. Are you okay so if we go back to when you were 18 and having those thoughts? Yeah, sure. Because you're, yeah. you were at the party and you were, you know, life of the party and then you're on your way home. At what sort of point did that kick in for you? Uh, I can remember it being about half hour. Like I had to drive about 25 kilometres home because I lived out of town. So I was always, you know, about half hour. I'd start crying and then and, and it was just this, it was like, I don't know, a, a radio, you, you heard the radio say it. Like it was just like, what the hell? And where did that come from and why is it there? And then it would be like at that point, logic would come back in and say, well, no, I, I obviously never did it. So there was some point that it, it didn't feel or seem real even though it was in my own head, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because um, it, it didn't make sense to me. And I don't think it makes sense to a lot of people why we have these feelings and it's, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm jumping ahead too much, but it wasn't until... I started um, learning about epigenetics that any of this made any kind of sense, that it could have been this, this my grandmothers or my great-grandfathers or great-great-great 15 generations ago or everyone in between, that it's there in the DNA, it's there in the cells of your body and, and this trauma from your past ancestors is sitting in there and it can be triggered at any moment because there was nothing in my life that was bad enough for me to think that way. You know, I'd had great parents, great school, great friends, all of that. Why was I feeling this way? So you don't have to have been in, in massive trauma or had some massive event for this to happen. And I think that's another thing. People think, well, I can't, I haven't got a story to tell. I haven't got a reason for feeling like this. People aren't going to understand me. I don't understand me. Mm. So they keep it bottled up. Who did you tell about that, about your thoughts at that time? No one. No one. Not even when I was in my 40s. I didn't tell anybody. I, 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 I seen a doctor who put me on, who subscribed medications and I threw it in the bin and I seen a counsellor um and and did some other therapies but no one in my life no friends no family i didn't talk about it to them back when i was 18 it wasn't talked about at all i didn't even know what it was when i was that age really like this is depression i didn't know what it was it was just this crazy talk in my head that i had to somehow deal with 
There was nothing in school educating. And I'm not sure if they do a, a good enough job now either, educating on emotions that you can start learning about. All the good emotions, the bad emotions, then the, the, the really bad emotions that can come. So talking about emotions, you go back to when you were 18, you go back to how you were feeling. What emotions, now I'm just going to ask this, can you still feel those moments in life now when you're 18? I, can you still go back to how that felt? No, because okay. I've done specific work that has cut the ties. A lot of people can if they don't. I've, I've got the scissors and I've cut. Mm -hmm. I can have the memory, I can remember the event, but I don't feel the emotion. And I think that's a really important thing because most things you still keep, you, unless you get this epigenetic fit, you're cutting the ties with all of the past, then you disassociate that emotion from that event. That's what healing is, as far as I'm concerned. I like Does that, that make sense? Yeah, for me, for me that does because different emotions, you know, we store them in our body. And our Absolutely. Yeah. Hence the reason why I'm asking you, can you still feel the emotions that you went through in that scenario? Because quite often when we go through a traumatic or a big emotional scenario, we can always go back to the feeling of that emotion. That, and mm. if your memory is everything that is stored in your memory is stored by emotion. If you meet someone and you think they're wonderful, then you remember that meeting. If you didn't think anything, then they'll say, oh, I met you and you thought, I've got no memory of that. You store memories by emotion. And, and this is why we can have so, memory, so many emotions without understanding them is because we store them, we pass them to the next generation in our DNA. So that's what our, grand, our ancestors have done to us. So I think that's what I had but I found a tool that actually cut the ties. So I can remember the event, but the emotion is not, no longer connected. I, I couldn't have talked about this. When I went to counselling, I walked in the door and I sat there and I just cried. I couldn't say the words. I couldn't talk about how I felt. I would just burst into tears. It was too heavy. It was too much. It hurt. So, yeah, Cutting the ties with the emotion, you've still got the memory, mm. but you don't yeah. have the emotion that's attached. That's where I'm at. Yeah, and I love that because it's Henry Colin, right? Mm. So if it's okay, I want to I want to move back to when you were 30, if that's right. And I really appreciate the work you've done and the work you do now has gifted you the opportunity of life. It's Henry Colin, right? And yeah. I, I really, I want to really open that up in the latter half of this. But if it's okay with you, I'd like to continue through. You've gotten through the 18, 19s, where suicidal thoughts were regular occurrence, driving home, driving into a tree, wanting to not be here, not understanding them at all, yeah. getting through that period. Yeah. So we've got, we're now through into um, your 30s, and it's hit back again. Would you like to share that with us? It came back stronger. Like I had um, two hip replacements in my early 30s. So there was a period of time where I couldn't walk 50 metres down the street. So I didn't go out. I didn't have a boyfriend. I couldn't have sex. Like there was just, I couldn't do nothing, you know. The, the pain of the physical pain was so bad. So that added to this feeling of being disconnected again, of being alone, of my life not going the way that I dreamed it would. I didn't have kids yet. Um, and the further I went through my 30s, the further the dream of becoming a mother got, and that was really hard because it was the only thing I'd ever wanted was to be a mum. I didn't have dreams of an actual career. I didn't want to be a hairdresser or an accountant or a doctor. I wanted to be a mum. So the further that I went, the, the deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper I got into the sadness, grief-stricken at being alone, at not having children, at not being a mum, all of these 
feelings there were so just so many and they layered on top of each other and every new event every time someone got pregnant oh my god trigger moment you know my family i'm my mother had uh there was 11 kids in her family there's five in mine my grandmother who passed away uh two years ago she has 117 direct descendants i have zero so I couldn't have said that when I was 40. I could not have said that sentence because it was too painful, you know. So, um, yeah, it was it was a daily struggle every single day, just getting out of bed and going through the motions. And being, and, and I, I, I lost me. I became somebody else. Because I was in so much pain, uh, the pain comes out as anger and you push people away and even though you want to be invited, you can't go because you know they're going to be talking about kids and you know they're going to be living their life and happy and whatever and I wasn't there. So it was this push and pull about being um, upset that I wasn't invited but not wanting to go anywhere anyway and if they did, I'd say no and it was... It was just this great big mess. My life was a mess and there was just no, I couldn't see any way out of it. And I was so toxic that at the time, I think, and I think I knew it as well, but I, I was so toxic. I was so angry. I was so bitter. I was so jealous of everybody else in the life that they had, even though I know now that, you know, some people are not as happy as what they appear to be. That was uh, definitely me. But can't remember what I was saying. I, I, I lost who I was. I couldn't be anything. So I was just at home. I'd go to work. I'd yell at people for no reason. I'd go home. I'd cry. And I would just hope and pray to die. I just wanted to die. Are the wheels turning or are you taking a moment? Take your moment. Take your moment. Take your moment. Learning who you are now and what what's going on for you and you. I think we're echoing a little bit on what's in your mind. That's okay. We'll keep going through it. For you not to be here, yeah, yeah. the world would miss something. I, I think that there was a reason, and now I can say that my my pain, my journey was was for a reason. It was to get me to where I am now, to be helping others, to have found the 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 tool that I now work with, the the work that I do with women that cutting the, the tie um, that connects the emotion to the event, you know, that holds us stuck. And when we think about the fact that we're dragging around so many generations worth of, of stuff, we're never going to really understand why we feel the way that we feel. Um, and some people obviously feel worse than others and some feel don't and some will be triggered halfway through. They will have a brilliant life for, you know, 40 years and then be triggered and all of a sudden it's there and they're, what the hell happened? But it's educating people on, on our emotions and how we live and what we inherit and then how our life experiences day by day by day add on to that. And how we can, if we understand, honestly, if we understand even just a little bit of this, it makes it easier to deal with. Because when you don't know why you feel like, if you feel like there's something wrong with you, and that makes it, like I said, you get into that mouse wheel of what the hell's wrong with me? It's not you. It's, you know, you've inherited stuff. It could have been your mother's, your great, 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 great grandfather's. It's not you. It's not you. You're not broken. And it can. It doesn't matter what it is. You can fix it. 
and I'm living proof of that. You know, I spent years thinking that just one more day or that's it, you know, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be here. And now I've had 10 years, just turned 50. I was, it was June, I think, June, the year I turned 40. So another month or so, it'll be 10 years since I cut the ties with the past emotion. Yeah. And I've had a lot of beautiful years of memories and joy and happiness and playing with nieces and nephews that I never would have done. Even if I had lived in the state that I was in, I never would have been any kind of joy to anyone. And they wouldn't have liked me. They would have felt the energy and just ran away. <laughs> yeah. That's a really interesting thing to say because to feel that energy, right? You're projecting the energy that is coming out, and absolutely, uh, that's that's a really big thing because it does drive people away. It pushes and by design, right? By yeah. design, you don't want people around you. You get out of here. Yeah, yeah, and it was leaching out of all the pores of me. I think you know, and it was like I had a, a sign on my forehead. F off, like it was printed, tattooed there. No one had come anywhere near me. And if they did, I yelled at them. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even help myself, even when I could hear myself, you know. I was like, what the hell? But it just, I was just spewing out the pain. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I couldn't help it. And I didn't want to be like that. So I tried a lot of different things um, and eventually one stuck. <laughs> One worked for me, so. How many things did you have to do in order to get to where you are? Um, look, I spent a lot of money and a lot of time. And I was right, I started in personal development in my early 30s. I left town and moved, because I always thought it was something external. So I went travelling and I lived in different towns and I'd quit a job and I'd go here and then if I just had a new job, if I just lived in a new city, if I just found a man, if I just had more money, if I just, if I just, if I just, then things would be better. I was looking externally. And I did counselling and therapy. I tried NLP. Um, I went to uh, Tony Robbins and T. Harvecker and I had books and courses and programs that I'd buy online and it was this constant just spending money thing. Something has to work. But there was something within me that knew I was the one who had to do it. There wasn't going to be some magic pill. Someone wasn't going to wave a wand and I would be better. So I kept on trying and I did. I spent a lot of time, a lot of money, you know, five, six, seven years of trying different things uh, until I found the one that worked. And, and it was, I think it would have been um, the last thing I tried. It was just like, you know, because the, 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 an email come just like just after my 40th birthday when I was at my absolute deepest lowest I went away for my 40th birthday to Sydney to the Star City Casino and I wanted to jump off the balcony when I was there all the girls were in getting ready to go out and I was out in the balcony crying so it was it was like just in time and it was just like okay so it's this female formulated, you know, it's, it, it works, it's been tried and tested and run, but better try it. What's, what's the harm? I've tried everything else. But, yeah, it was the one thing that that worked and, as I say, the rest is history. I've, you know, had 10 years of, of you know, none of that. It, it's gone. Do you it doesn't you live in my body. It doesn't live yeah. in my body, that yeah. pain, yeah. Do you mind sharing with us a moment out on the balcony? <laughs> um, geez. I we had um I didn't want I didn't want to do anything on my birthday because I wasn't in a partying mood. I wasn't in a celebrating mood. Um, but a couple of my girlfriends, oh, you know, we'll do this, we'll, we'll, and they organised everything, they'd invited everybody, they'd booked it, before they even told me, they probably knew I'd say no. 
So we got down there and we started drinking. And if you've you know got any kind of emotional baggage, you know drinking doesn't help. It just makes you want to cry soon, I think. Um, so we we had a few drinks and everyone was happy and and then everyone just went and they were in getting excitedly ready putting their makeup on changing their clothes and I'm just I don't do this you know I was just so I, I went out on the balcony and I was sort of I guess I was just having a drink and I was just like I just want to jump I don't want to be here you know even though I'm surrounded by the people who are, my, are the closest, I feel alone. I feel like I'm not seen. So it was, hmm, it was like, I just don't want to. I just don't want to be here. I just don't think I can do this. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so important to hear what are the stories and to hear hear what's going on so that we can feel yeah it. yeah you you can and you can resonate if there's one person that resonates now oh, shit that's me she she did it i can do it too you know and that's and that's why i i tell my story i haven't it, it took a long time for me to, I, ha, I had it public, but my, my mum and dad weren't on Facebook, they weren't on technology, so they had no way of seeing it. Um, but they have since just um, got on, and I think it would only hurt them to hear this. Yeah, so they're the only ones that I don't want to hear my story because I think they would be devastated to know that, I was in that spot and they didn't know. It's interesting because quite often you know how people are feeling, you just don't know how to approach it. Though. That's possible. It's it's it seemed to me like, and and this was in my state back then it seemed to me like nobody cared nobody saw nobody knew because you'd sit at a table and everyone would be talking and they would be living their life and they didn't notice that's what it felt like to me so it wasn't something that I spoke about at the time it wasn't anything that I brought up to anybody else around me mm. they were in a different it was like they were in a different time zone or a different state, you know. They they weren't anywhere where they could understand, well, this is me coming from that place, you know, where I was at that time and, and my thinking then. It, it may be a little bit different now, but, uh, but I still don't think um, people a lot of the time can see past what's going on in their own lives. I mean, I know a lot of people want to, and a, and a lot of people do, but there are a lot of people that don't. They're, they're, they can be wrapped up and, you know, it's like those ones who say, hey, you know, my door's open, come and have a coffee with me. It, it, it's not going to happen. They're not saying, you know what, Maria hasn't, she hasn't been out, you know, I haven't heard from, I haven't seen from, I have to go and see her and see how she's doing. And that's how it has to be to actually help someone who's in that deep, dire state. They won't reach out. You have to reach in. Thank you for saying And I think your conversations is doing that. Yeah. I'll, I'll open that up in a little bit because I think that's something that's really important to see people to and to touch base with people. Yeah, and so if, if they're angry, if they're sad, if they're not going out when they used to, there are there are signs. But again, that's having um, that known. 
If it's okay, I would like to open that up in a little bit. I really want to honour you and thank you for sharing everything from your experience. Um, I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to go over to Sharon and absolutely so as well. Um, and I just, I just want to honour everybody sitting here watching this and bringing the comments in because they are absolutely beautiful. They're heartfelt. And I'd rather not answer everything at the minute because I want to stay in here. If you feel like you want to have a discussion with somebody on this panel, please reach out. All three of us are here to have a discussion with you for this, okay? Mm -hmm. So I really want to, because there's, I love some of the comments and I'll, we'll get through to those, all right? But thank you. And thank you, Maria. I just want to put this up quickly because I think this is very important. Maria, you are wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks, Shaz. Yes. All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to mute you if that's okay, Maria, because I'm trying to sort this yep. out going out. That's okay. But thank you, and we'll come back shortly. All right. Um, Ani Shaz, how are you? Very well, thank you. And... Maria, that was amazing. I knew a little of your story from our discussions, but, yeah, just amazing. And I think I said yesterday that our stories are almost opposite, you know, which is good for this panel because, you know, you were left feeling, so what is this? Why, why am I feeling this way? I kind of knew <laughs> why I was feeling it, but I couldn't fix it. So, um my story just quickly is, you know, dysfunctional family in childhood. Um, dad was alcoholic. There was some level of abuse. Mum, like a lot of partners of alcoholics, became very controlling um, and still has control issues to this day. So, and, and uh, my siblings were both um, special needs, intellectually disabled. So I was expected to shine but not, you know, encouraged or, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, you know, everything I did was not good enough. So I grew up like that, um, which creates, you know, those things we call limiting beliefs and, you know, the, the, the three universal fears, the not worthy, not loved, not belonging. So I had all of that. Um, I married into a wonderful family. I had a wonderful partner. Um, took us a long time to have kids. We had a few issues there. Um, there, you know, there were some problems in the marriage and then we were on very different paths. And uh, But when I did um, have two kiddies, I um, developed really severe postnatal depression and ended up in, um, you know, in a hospital ward for a month and they had me on suicide watch and I used to, I was allowed to have my baby in with me um, up to 12 months and I used to pop her in the stroller and take her for a walk and they asked me not to cross the main road and that I didn't realise that there was a security officer watching me and, you know, the last thing on my mind was to take that child with me. Um, I did often think about ways to end my own life. I felt like, you know, I wasn't a good mum. Uh, I used to call myself a fruit loop, you know. I, I, the the self-talk was so negative, you know. Um, it was, you know, you're not good at this, you should be good at this, you're a bloody teacher. Why aren't you good at this? Why are you so depressed? Why are you so miserable? Um, you know, um, you should be a good mum. You know, should, 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 and felt that I wasn't. So I used to, my um, in-laws would look after the kids for me while I went shopping at Indrapilly, and I used to think about where I would have to drive my car through the park bollards to go into the river. And that was my regular thought pattern um, quite often as I went off to do some shopping, you know, which is usually a great time for a mum to escape, you know. 
Um, and, you know, people think, how, how could you leave your kids? But you're thinking to yourself, oh, they'd be better off without me. You know, he'll find somebody else. Um, you know, there's family to look after them. I just thought I was such a loss, you know, such a dead loss. And, you know, I look at that now and it's it's just so foreign. I can still feel it and I'm glad I can still feel it. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was some pretty negative thoughts. And then the next time it happened was um, after my um, separation and divorce, which is about five, six years ago now. And, um, look, I was drinking heavily. I was dating badly. I was sitting on the couch watching rubbish television, you know, with a bottle in one hand and a tub of ice cream in the other. I was self-sabotaging to the nth degree um, and there were several times that I thought I would take my life. I felt that I'd let my family down, my kids who were 17 and 19, again, you know, it was all that self-punishment, you know. I've let everybody down. I'm a fruitcake. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm, you know, I'm no good to anybody. Um, I was absolutely miserable about the breakdown of the marriage and, and um, mostly that I felt I let my kids down. And yet it was those kids that kept me going to live for them, you know, to, to not leave them without a mum, no matter how dysfunctional I was at the time and then that's when I started my personal development journey so I started with giving up the grog and then I did like you Maria I did all the courses give me every book give me every course I studied coaching um, I had some time with Maria with with her methodology I had um, you know time with other coaches and then I gradually just started putting my own model together, um, which is all the stuff that we know. We know that we need to get to bed early. We know that we need to exercise. We know that we need to meditate. You know, we know all this stuff. Um, but I'm glad you also mentioned, Maria, epigenetics because, um, you know, I've studied some of that too and, you um, and one of one of the parts of my model. Sorry, I'm trying to use my phone tonight. <laughs> it's, it's dodgy. I'm tripping on cables. And, um, but yeah, one of one of the letters. So it goes E M O J I for emoji. So exercise, energy, E F T, tapping, uh, which is emotional freedom technique, um, uh, emotions, and how to regulate and express emotions how to be real, you know, vulnerable and honest. And when we get to the I, so M is meditation and mindfulness, et cetera, um, and when we get to the I, inner healing, you know, I encourage everybody to find the right person and the right modality, whether it's the work that Maria does, whether it's Scott, you know, myself, you know, find someone who can help you to find your story and to express it, to get it out. Because what we do is push it down. Like you said, Maria, you know, it's nothing to see here and we, we don't often tell people, we don't share. And that's what we need to encourage the kids to do is to share their stories, um, you know, to go in and sit on the bed, you know, with their permission. I used to say to my son, can I sit on the bed? He'd say, yeah, sure. I'd say, what's going on? you know, and just talk it through and just that every day, every second day, whatever feels comfortable for both of you and just keep getting your friend or your family member or your child or your parent to express, just leave that opening to have that discussion like we do here, Scott, you know. It's just so, so vital for people to have a safe place to open up no matter who that is. So, so, yeah, I mean, women, uh, we've talked a lot about men's suicide here in this, this group, um, but women, you know, have, have similar but different issues. I think, I think for men a lot of the time it's about being the protector and the provider and if that doesn't 
you know, meet your own expectations. Um, with women, it's, you know, I have to be the nurturer. I have to look after everybody. Um, but here I am, you know, a mess. Um, and that may not be children, Maria, you know, that could be your parents or your sister or whoever, you know. If you feel that you're not able to take care of others, you can tend to feel like a letdown, I think. There's a reason why nurses and teachers have the highest rates of um, depression in women, you know, because we're supposed to look after people. So, yeah, but that's my story. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to I thank you for that. And, and it's something for me that um, the statistics show that more men commit suicide. Yes. But a lot of women are thinking about it. Yeah. And when a woman makes a decision, she's more likely to be successful than a man. Yeah. So mm. with that in mind, suicidal thoughts, and I'm just going through the comments, they're common. Yeah. And it's very much very much an internal dialogue that we need to work on. Mm. The one thing I'm hearing from both of you is how personal development has grown, helped you grow through this. Yeah. So I really want to honour you both for sharing your stories and for sharing with us your journeys through that. Right now, I'd really like to talk about how you got through that. What are the, what are the key factors that have brought you to now. And you, you're both doing amazing work. You're both able to talk openly about this. Mm. So what got you to that point? I'm going to start with you if I can, Maria. <clears throat> for, for me, it was gaining an understanding of how my mind works, of um, how genetics works, how it wasn't my fault, it wasn't something that I did, it wasn't just me, it wasn't a life experience as such as, you know, you can look at other people and say, well, I can understand they're depressed because they, you know, lost a child or something happened. Mm -hmm. Why am I like this? But there is nothing logical about emotions. And... I don't know if you or the people watching this understand, when you're feeling, thinking logically, your, your brain lights up, the neurons light up at the front of your brain. This is when you're thinking and, and working and doing everything. But when you're emotional, when you're really emotional, these lights turn off. The lights at the back of your brain turn on and these ones turn off. So there is no logical thinking going on. When someone commits suicide, and I know we're, we're trying to get away from that, but when someone is in a really emotional state, there is no thought of anyone else. There is no thought of what tomorrow could bring. There's no thought of logical stuff. It is all feeling. Mm. And that's in, in understanding how you're just that little bit, understanding that, you know, you, you can be completely emotional and not make any sense. That's because the front of your brain's turned off. But you have to be aware that you don't want it to stay turned off. You have to, you know, do or take some steps to try and release that emotion in some way so that you can get back to feeling the logical, you know, if, if that's always off, then you've got more chance of doing something that's not logical, something that's going to harm you in some way. Um, and I think uh, for women, there is a, a part of our biology, you know, we grow the human inside of us. Therefore, we're more, there, there's this program that is a part of who we are um, mm. that mm. says we can't leave the kids. Not that women don't, but they're more likely to stay because of this program that's mm -hmm. running in here that they're not even aware of. And men are not aware of that program because they don't have that program. It's not saying that they don't love kids or anything exactly the same. We just have different programs, different apps, if you like, a different hardware that's running different mm -hmm. software. 
and that's just the way we are biologically. Um, and, and I think that can be the difference. Both the sexes are struggling with depression and emotion stuff, but no one's teaching anyone about emotions, that you can feel hurt and you can feel sad. And, and I don't know if men have the noise that runs around in their heads as much as whether we're not good enough and we're not smart enough and we're not worthy. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's just a constant all the time that never, ever stops unless you can find something that, you know, can cut that tie, like I said. But, um, yeah, just knowing the smallest little bits about your brain or your biology or the way that things work can help you say, wow, God, it's not just me. I'm not the only person. I'm not, it's, it's not me. I can learn and I can grow and I can change and I can take some control of this. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of, going and taking a pill which still doesn't give you that control it's still not helping you understand you and your story is going to be different to every other person in the whole entire planet because we don't know what was in your ancestry we don't know where your soul's been basically you know your grandmother and your great 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 greats you are your own person and no one else is the same but you're not on your struggle alone. We can all learn from it and change and gain control and even a little bit by little bit by little bit. I hope that helps. I love that. I love that and I want to encourage that. Little bit by little bit by little bit. And that's where you got to start. We're complex humans. We're very mm. complex. Yeah. We've got a lot of stuff going on up here. Don't take it all on at once. Mm. Yep. Okay. Because that's something that I've had to learn myself. Incremental improvements consistently compound to a, more, a massive opportunity of growth. Mm. You know, and I'm sitting here and I'm, and I'm listening to you, Maria, but I'm, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to hold, hold off on what I was going to say then because I'll, I'll bring it up after... I speak to Anish Shaz, that's right. And thank you for sharing that. So, Anish Shaz, for you. Yo. What were the things that got you? What did you? How did you start? Improving yeah, I think you? I. Yeah. Yeah. Couple of courses, a uh, couple of books. Um, you know, you only have to jump on to Facebook to find free courses. Uh, information on mental health. There's all those um, groups, you know, Are You OK, Beyond Blue, Headspace. And then there's, you know, practitioners like Maria and myself and yourself, Scott, you know, people that specialise in different, different areas or different people. Um, the information is out there. Um, you know, some people can't afford to hire a coach, um, but like I say, there's a lot of free stuff or or um, very modest, you know, modestly priced stuff out there, and that's a starting point. And and then sometimes you find, okay, well, I need something deeper. I need the sort of work that Maria does, or you know, I've got teenagers, so I'll go to Auntie Shares or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, books and courses, um, and and what happens is. You know, I see another course and I'm halfway through that course and I see another course that I think, oh, that would be helpful. You know, I've just signed up to <laughs> another one next week um, because a lot of the coaches that I've worked with are also evolving. So, you know, there's one that I follow in particular and I think I've done three courses with him now. But I, And I thought, oh, I don't need to do any more with him. What's he, what's he advertising now? And then I read it and thought, oh, I need that. <laughs> so, so I'm one of those, um, you know, the junkies, the, the personal development junkies. But then that's why I've put it all together in my model, in the emoji model, where, you know, that'll come out later on this year to tell people what all the strategies are, you know. Um, and if we can't fit the name of a strategy like Maria's is Creatrix, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find a letter of emoji where it will fit. Like it would be under mm -hmm. inner work, you know, it would be inner work. You know, who do I go and see to do that inner, inner healing? 
So, mm. yeah. So, um, and, you know, if it's um, O for own your shizzle and you've got an addiction, I can tell you who to go and see tomorrow, you know. Uh, I worked with Tom Cartwright, who's probably, you know, the best addiction coach in the country. And he's now working, collaborating with another coach, Nat Hodges, and, you know, what the two of them don't know about addiction isn't there. So, you know, it's there are so many people available and um, it's just finding your path and finding the right help. So can I grab that? Because I just I want to sort of bring that back a little bit because you've both been on a journey of personal development and it yep. wasn't the first thing that you did that actually changed anything. It's been a progression of continually yep. working on things until you find the thing that works for you. Yeah. yeah. Because of, because of that, that's the number one thing for me. And I'm just I'm, I'm looking at the way in which we're talking about this and it's one of the things for, for myself with the experiences that I've had. The single biggest thing we can do is own our story. Yeah. Find a way to process our story through coaching, through counselling, through the before-mentioned opportunities. But then find growth. Be interested in yourself. Being curious takes us out of here and takes us into the opportunity of what is available. You know? So I'm really enjoying listening to you both about the... Like your eyes are dancing as you're talking about the growth, which is a long way from where you both were 10 years ago. Mm. Which is another thing I just want to bring up just quickly is be kind to yourself. Mm. If you are feeling the emotions of being suicidal, okay, what is it I'm feeling? Is it my sad? Am I angry? Nominate your nominate the emotion. What is it? Get curious about what it is. Exactly what is it that it's actually bringing this on? Try mm. and name. It. And ask yourself: Is it yours, or is it somebody else's? Mm. Which I don't. Th I'd never heard of that. It wasn't something that was in my awareness. We only know what we know until we know something more. So. Um, and it's all about knowing something more is, is, is those steps on the journey. But if it's not yours, then you can choose to let it go. You know, if you know, well, there wasn't something that happened that makes me feel this way, well, then you know what? It could be back there. Let's let it go. I love that. So there's been a question here that I am actually just going to uh, open up because... Um, Shez has asked, honey Shez, if that's okay, what would you do for teenagers? Yeah, thanks, Shez, for asking. Um, I, I use my emoji model with teenagers. So I get them journaling, which is J. I get them exercising. Um, one of the first things we do with families is believe it or not, is put a whiteboard up and put all the household chores up there and get everybody contributing because a lot of these teenagers are feeling, you know, just separate to the family. You know, they're sitting in their rooms and they're gaming and, and then we're whining at them that they're not doing anything to contribute. So, you know, let's all get on the same page. We're a team. We're a team now. And we, and we all help out and here's all the jobs. Help me write out all the jobs that need to be done. We put columns Monday to Sunday and we all put our initial in the column to say that we have contributed to the team and go us. We make a vision board, you know, a family mission statement. But for the teens in particular, yeah, we have a look at, as Maria said and Scott, the emotions you know, rather than pushing the tennis ball down in the jar, and I show them that I have a I have a little fish tank and a tennis ball, and we talk about you know pushing them down, nothing to see here, or let's get them up so that we're not exploding at our little brother or our 
mum or our teacher, you know, what, what's going on there? You know, for example, anger, they say sometimes is, is actually fear or sadness in disguise. And if you think about the times that you're angry, you can almost pinpoint, oh, that's, I was actually really sad but it came out as anger. I was actually really in fear, but it came out as anger, you know, and that's where, you know, we use things with teens like above the line and below the line thinking. Am I thinking above the line or am I blaming others and, you know, deflecting the responsibility? I think they're doing some good commercials at the moment where somebody on the telly is saying, uh, not my problem, <laughs> not my job. Yeah, below the line thinking. So, um, yeah, so we use some of those sorts of models with them and, and get them thinking a little bit differently. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because, like, it's mm. just to get people to think differently is, is something big. And I feel yes. the only way in which we can do that is to actually action that. Yeah. You know, we can't personally ask somebody to do something that we don't do ourselves. Yeah. So I have my relationship with Oscar, right? And he has permission to pull me up. <laughs> I've given him permission because if I'm if I'm to suggest something to him that we should follow through with this, I can't ask him not to do the same back. Yeah. You know. So my. It's the old leader horse to water, and I'm, I'm being cautious here because I actually know shares, so I'm being cautious with how I say this. But it's, you know, if we want someone to go somewhere, we have to go ourselves, yeah. you know, and that's, and that's with everything. And sometimes our own journey will actually encourage others to go with us, you know. Yeah. And it's the number one thing here for me is there's absolutely no right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which may seem a bit crazy, but it's it's just consistently <laughs> trying something until it works. Mm. Keep trying. 1%, 1%, 1%. <clears throat> so, I remember there's no logic to emotions. <laughs> so no. you don't have to understand why you're feeling how you're feeling. This is what I'm feeling. This is what it is. I'm going to let it out instead of bottling it up or pushing it mm. down. <clears throat> and just one thing with especially teenagers with girls because you have a cycle that's up down up down up down all this every week of every month there are going to be weeks where you're going to be feeling emotion more than you do in other weeks there's going to be weeks where you can study better than in the other three weeks there's going to be if you understand that cycle you can you know, you tell your little brother what week he can't come and bug you and come into your room and then there's harmony in the house kind of thing. So, yeah, educating on who we are, how we how we work can only help. Yeah. yeah no, no, I, think, I think that is actually being open with what our needs are. Hmm. Learn enough about yourself so that you can express your needs, and yeah. that's that's the one thing that personal development <clears throat> I feel so greatly with so many things. And it's a journey. I'm still mm. on my journey, Maria. You're still on yours, and only shows you're still on yours. We're still learning. We're still growing because we need that in order to continually be able to sit with others. Mm. You know, and I think that's the most important thing. Well, I can't believe it. We're already at 58 minutes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there's some absolutely amazing comments in here, and I can't thank everybody enough for, mm. for um, sharing your comments and sharing how you feel. Um, Arnie shows Maria, I'm actually going to ask you guys to go back in and reach out to whoever you need to reach out to, if that's yep. okay. Um, I think that's super, super absolutely. important. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, I would like very much um, for one bit of advice from both both of you that you would give a younger version of yourself. Um, Ryan. Oh, goodness. Um, for, for me, looking back, 
I would would tell myself that no matter what, no matter what noise is, is going around in your head, you are good enough and you are worthy. Mm. Um, that's that's who you are, who you were born to be, and it's just noise that gets in the road. Um, and don't let it distract you and hold you back from being who you are. Um, and don't let others tell you who to be. I can remember being, um, you know, in the schoolyard, the youngest, five, six, seven, and, and people say, oh, well, if you're confident, you're stuck up. If, you, you know, you think you're good enough, if you, you know. So you were slapped down right at the very beginning of life and told what you couldn't be. Don't let people do that. It's like, you know, get off your magic shield and bounce off everything that everybody else says. You be true to you. Yeah, that's it. Be true to you. I love that. I just love that. And sorry, I just, I just know a little note for myself. So find out who you can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I love that. Thank you very much, Maria. Honey shows. Oh, come from love, not fear. So when you're having a run-in with someone, mm. come from love because we so often come from fear. Uh, step outside your comfort zone because that's where the growth and learning occur. And for the families, keep talking, keep talking. Dinner every night <laughs> as often as you can around the table. What went well for you today? What didn't go well? And you'll be amazed what comes out. And develop that ability to go and sit on the bed and say, what's going on? And if now's not a good time because you've got to finish that level, you know, hey, buddy, need to have a chat with you. When would be good for you? Okay, 15 minutes. See you then. Come out and help me chop up some veggies and we'll have a yarn, you know, or go and kick a footy or whatever. Yeah, keep keep the lines of communication open, and and stop being frightened of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> we're the parents, we're the boss. Just don't yeah. tell them that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ash. I'm just I'm just sitting there, just picturing it. You know, like yeah, know, seeing seeing how we move through this because it is difficult for all involved. Yeah, you know, and. and one of the things I, I, I would like to talk about next time is how to recover from suicide attempts because yeah. it's something that, you know, you lose trust and things like that and it's a big conversation. Huge. But it would be nice to get to a point where those conversations had to be had less. Yeah. You know? And I just I want to um, finish tonight with something that, I'm actually super proud of. It's only been in the last 10, 15 years that we've been able to have open conversations about mental health. We're now having open conversations about suicide. We're not avoiding the word. We're, we're, yeah. we're talking about suicidal scenarios. We're talking about how we've had suicidal thoughts. I'm actually very grateful that we have these opportunities. And I actually think we're at a time of life right now that we're actually going to be able to do something about this because we're accepting what is and we're challenging that. To everyone out there, I just really want to thank you for doing your best. I really want to thank you for being here, for listening, for taking the opportunity and the time to invest in just trying to find a way to do something better so that tomorrow is a better day. It's a better day because you were here. Yeah. Uh, thank you enough for that. Maria, Anishia, thank you so much for being a part of a conversation that if we look at it right now, after an hour and five minutes, we just have to have a safe place to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Find your safe place. And thank, thank you, you Scott. Yeah.
Thank, Thank you, you yeah. for providing that safe place for us to tell our stories, Scott, and with such empathy. Thank you. You're worth it, honey, Shaz. We all are. We're all worth sharing our stories. Yep. I feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world because I get to hear people. I get to share people how people feel. I, you trust me enough to share this? Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you so much. Mm. And we do you, mate. Yep, absolutely. And all the people are going to help with this, these conversations and this making absolutely. it, making it a, 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 a not taboo, making it a, an open, honest way of... You, Finding out something that's going to get you that next step, that next day, mm. and whatever and however it helps. But, yeah, just having the conversation. Yeah, I love it. And we did tonight. So on that note, I'm going to finish with that one. Thank you so much. Thank you, campus. Um, back next week with something that is probably, probably actually a bit of a follow-on from this conversation, acknowledgement to be seen, how to see somebody, something that's really important, mm -hmm. something that I feel can all do a little bit better. <laughs> On that note, thank you, campers. Again, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Arnie Shows. Back next week. Take care and reach out. Bye. We're here. We're not just having these conversations. We've got tools. We've got a community yeah. of people that know how to support you in moments of need. But it's up to you to reach out. We're here. We're here for you. All right. Take care, campus. Ciao for now. Bye. Right. Where is that? Bye. Bye. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs>